Guten Tag, es freut mich sehr, dass ich hier bin. Für mich, äh, Vienna war immer ein Träumstadt. Uh, that's pretty much, as much as I'm going to go in German. Um, let me explain what you're going to get tonight. In 2013, I was working as a professor of economics, monetary policy. And I was chatting with some of my trader tra friends because I used to work as a trader. And we were parallel watching Ben Bernanke and I was listening, that was during that period of uh, what they called temper tantrum, where Bernanke said they're gonna raise interest rates and the stock market collapsed. And I was listening to him and I was like, wow, this is really good. This guy gets everything. This is really coherent, makes sense, everything's great. And then I was chatting with my friend and my friend was like, this guy's an idiot, he's gonna blow up everything. And I was like, but no, 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 this is really, really smart. This makes all the sense in the world. And then I realized that what I'm talking about is a professor of economics, monetary policy talk. What my friend is talking about is the trader's view, how traders view the market. What you're going to get today is the perspective of both. We're gonna talk some economics, and then we're gonna talk trader stuff. And you will see why traders view everything differently and why everything that is happening in a market from an economics theory perspective doesn't make sense while from a trader's perspective makes all the sense in the world. And then considering the events of last couple of days, I'm not going to give you possibilities of what is going to happen. As of last Tuesday, there are no more futures. There's only one future. Everything is known. So I will run you step by step through everything that's gonna happen in the United States and everything that's gonna happen in Europe. I know it sounds preposterous, but by the end of the lecture, you will see that, where's the buttons? That that's how it's gonna run through. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do an economic overview of some data in Europe, because that's really important for traders. Then we're gonna do monetary policy in the US. We're gonna specially focus on coordination of monetary policy in the US. Coordination between fiscal and monetary policy, which is actually maybe even beyond perfect. And then I'm gonna give you Fed's game plan. I'm gonna tell you what they ultimately want, which is not to decrease inflation or raise interest rates. Now, this is, a, this is the list of problems. This is, these are the problems. When European Union was expanding, there was this great talk of convergence, meaning that what Margaret Thatcher said, the gap that used to be here, it's gonna go up here, it's gonna get smaller. Well, th that hasn't happened. You know, everyone said in Croatia, you know, we're going to join European Union and economic growth will go up. We're gonna converge in terms of wealth and standard with other European countries. That hasn't happened. If you look at the data, we actually have smaller rates of growth between 13 and 19 than Albania and Bosnia. And we have smaller rates of growth than Czech Republic, Slovakia, Bulgaria. So the convergence mechanism in terms of standard doesn't work. Second, all the stuff that kind of equalize in US don't exist in uh, Europe, Be especially, for example, in two things. One are taxes and property prices. So if you, if you take a million dollars and you go to a large city like New York, what can you buy? But if you go to another large city like Kansas City or Austin, Texas, you can buy something completely different. So what does million dollars buy you in Manhattan? What does million dollars buy you in Austin, Texas? And these are both large, prosperous cities. So if you look at the property prices, in Croatia, they're literally out of proportion. If you take, for example, the average salary versus, for example, the average square meter in Zagreb, that doesn't make sense. So there's no that equalizer where I say, okay, I have a smaller paycheck, but other big stuff is cheaper. Also in terms of, for example, state tax and local tax. 
we have, for example, the second highest value added tax in Europe. While as a poorer country, shouldn't we have the reverse? Same with the income tax. So all these things are not working. Well, uh, on the other hand, all the negative stuff, like prices, are converging. So for example, if you take a price of bread, if you take a price of milk, if you take a price of the household stuff, they're really converging fast towards Europe. Salaries, not that much. So this is the kind of dream that was supposed to occur, but it never has. Now, let's move on to several data pieces. What we're going to focus is debt. And I will show you all the wrong stuff and all the right stuff. So let's start with the wrong stuff. This is inflation. So if we look at the inflation, you will see a highly diverse picture. And this is not a diverse picture as of now where we're in inflationary period. If you take this data, for example, in 2008, where we had the last kind of smaller inflationary period, or if you take this data in 2019, you will see these huge waves. This, ma this makes monetary policy almost impossible because you have countries like France that have inflation close to 6% and you have Estonia with over 20%. These two countries cannot have the same monetary policy because Estonia needs a completely different monetary policy from France. France can have, you know, one or two percent raise in interest rates. Estonia probably needs seven or eight. So you have a European average, you know, put it in red so everyone can see, but this average doesn't make sense because you do not have a European nation. You have sovereign countries. So the problem here is that the need for monetary policy is exceptionally different. So having one monetary policy really doesn't have that much effect. And on top of that, as we'll see, there are other issues that are really important. Now, let's look at another completely wrong picture that doesn't make sense. When the master's criteria in order to create euro were created, they said we need a common denominator. How do we adjust for size? So everyone said, okay, let's, the simplest thing is let's do a ratio of GDP. So what's the GDP per capita? What's the debt to GDP? So if you look at this picture, you kind of see that almost everyone has a problem. You know, there are these countries like Greece, and Italy that have, oh, as a good headmaster, Greece and Italy, they have, you know, over 100%. But even the good guys, you know, that are below 60, you know, Estonia is approaching 20, Luxembourg's over 20, and you have all these bunch in the middle. So if you see, especially after COVID, all of this went up. So if you look at this, you see that average, year 19 is close to 100, but this is actually relevant. No one has ever shorted or bought bonds on size of debt. One of the famous lies they tell you at school is that size of debt is important. Or the finance guys, they will take, uh, you know, for example, EBITDA uh, versus, G, uh, versus debt to see is the company, does the company have too much debt? That doesn't make any sense because it doesn't matter how much debt you have. What matters is when does it mature? So if you take a million euros and you take a person like me, so if I say I have a debt of million euros and my income is 10,000 euros annually, well, that sounds really bad. It sounds like I'm really over indebted. And if my debt matures this year, then I'm facing a bankruptcy. But what if it matures in 30 years? So I can save, invest, and pay off that debt, not a problem. So it's not 
as a bond trader, the size of debt doesn't matter. What matters is the term structure. When does the debt mature? When does repricing, refinancing come in? It doesn't matter does a country have a lot or a little debt, especially in this relation. Like, what does it mean that someone has 100% of GDP? Again, if average maturity is two years versus average maturity of 10 years. So when we're looking at debt, especially European debt, we actually have to look at the size. And this is the bad picture. This is the bad picture. Because see, who has the most debt? Ooh, Germany. So you're being told that Germany is a good country, a country where the fiscal policy is really sound, that doesn't have any fiscal problems. That's actually not true. If you want to talk about top three, well, the top three, France, Italy, and Germany, have 62% uh, of debt, of total debt. If you look at top four, for Euro 19, so the Eurozone, you're basically looking at 80% of debt. So four countries have 80% of debt. Why is that incredibly important? Well, let's look at countries that, for lack of a better word, are non-relevant to traders. Like you see here, like these guys, Estonia, Malta, Latvia, Bulgaria, Luxembourg, you can't trade their debt. It's too small. There's no reason to short them. There's no reason to create any kind of speculative attack. These figures, as we're about to see, are irrelevant. If you want to do a speculative attack on currency and on bond market, you need to have size. These countries, they have no size. Now, why is no size really important? Because if you really need money, someone's going to give it to you. Like if Estonia needs 3 billion euros, that's not a lot of money. You know, look at the size of balance sheets of European banks, of American banks. If they need 3 billion, they're going to get it. But if you need 300 billion, who's going to give it to you? And what rate? So if you're looking at these three guys, which are like my three favorite countries, I don't do Spain, but I do these three guys all the time. They have, one, huge deficits in terms of numbers. You know, what is 2% of German GDP? What is 2% of Estonian GDP? And also, they have huge refinancing. If a Germany needs to refinance this year, 2% of their GDP, that's a lot of money in comparison to Estonia. So if we're talking about bond trading and how to set up a speculative attack on currency, this is the data you look. Absolute values, not relative values. And it doesn't even matter in just the size. What also matters is the next economic state. See, all this debt was generated under certain conditions. These conditions no longer exist. What has happened is that as of 2001, 2021, I'm sorry, we are not in the same economic condition we were or state before. So all the data, all the analysis, all the relationships are null and void. They're absolutely irrelevant. The new economic system starts in 2021. And I will explain to you on the data why this is so relevant. So let's do numbers. And I know this is bad and all that. It's, I wanted really to put everyone. And I've put in debt and GDP growth. And if you see, this is from 2012. So I've deliberately put the last really big crisis. COVID, 
wasn't an economic crisis. It had economic effects, but it wasn't caused by economy. It wasn't caused by policy. Someone said, we're going to shutting down the economy. Well, that's not an economic problem. That's a political health issue, which, again, I don't want to treat it as an economic thing. But if you look at the last economic crisis, it was the debt crisis. So if you look at these numbers, they've went up a lot. And all the big countries have more debt. So if you look at, for example, again, the bottom guys, Estonia, Estonian debt as of 21 is $5 billion. That's not money. I mean, there are companies in Austria that have debt to banks more than $5 billion. So in terms of, you know, size, absolute size, yeah, it's an increase of 200%. But in terms of money, it's $3 billion. So it's not a problem. On the flip side, if you go up and you go to Euro area or European Union, you see a $3 trillion. And you go to France and you see 920 billion euros. I'm sorry, I'm constantly in dollars. This is all in euros. I'm constantly in dollars, trading in dollars. So dollar is my currency. So this is the size. So the size of the debt has increased tremendously. That's what's important. Now, the importance of this lies that in a couple of slides, we're going to design a speculative attack on a currency and bond market. I will basically run you how to destroy a country using the bond market. It's not that hard. Let's do the deficits. Everything that I'm telling you and why I have explicitly stated there's no, there are no more futures. Because this thing started in 2019. In 2019, a piece of data didn't make sense. And that was France. If you look, so these are the deficits of how much deficits each country has had. You look at France's deficit. Yeah, here, France. goes up. So here you have basically a perpetual constant decrease from 100 billion to 54 and it goes up to 74. I didn't like this. It was a good economic year. Everything was working out nicely. Sure there were some problems, you know, France always has problems. But I didn't like this increase. I looked at another country, Spain, it also had an increase. German uh, surplus considerably decreased. I did not like that at all. So I asked myself, what is actually going on? If you go back to the data at that point in time, you will see two things. First, the prices of commodities have started to rise. You had an increase in oil prices, in uh, steel, in uh, coal. And the PPI started to increase. And to me, this basically said this. We, the monetary policy is too much. There's no way to stop inflation anymore. Inflation has started to creep in into the economy. An increase in inflation will increase deficits, will increase debt burdens, and euro is going to heavily devalue. And this was the initial starting point of the data. And then COVID came. And you see an explosion in deficits. And just to get this thing immediately out of the way, from my perspective, both COVID and Ukraine are economically irrelevant. They're irrelevant. I will say again, not relevant. And I'll explain why. They are time relevant. So if you look, let's assume I'm correct. We'll never know because COVID came. The prices of commodities are going up. This has started to translate into producer's price index. Ultimately, 
it has to translate into um, consumer's price index. So what COVID and Ukraine did, it just shortened the time. Instead of this happening over two or three years, a little, it happened a lot. You have an explosion of the deficits and you have an explosion of inflation. Now, why is this really good for people like me? Because the policy response function of the central banks, especially EU, ECB, didn't get to react. They weren't fast enough. They didn't catch on. The system has changed, which basically opened a door for people like me. Or I should be more precise, fish like me. You'll see why. So these two events, Ukraine war and COVID, basically also created a worse starting point. Remember the previous slide, how we had a lot of surplus in Germany and that was kind of being handled and then all of a sudden you have an explosion in debt. So if, again, if you wanna create <clears throat> a really bad situation and have a currency and bond speculative attack on a country, you wanna have a lot of debt and you wanna have high inflation. So what these things did for me both uh, Ukraine and COVID was basically create a worse starting point and really uh, increase the pace of things. Things became really, really fast. Now, however, the debt payments, because of the decrease in interest rates, have decreased considerably. This is a horrible thing. I know all of you look at this and you say, but how can it be bad if I used to pay, for example, look, let's do Belgium. If I used to pay 13 billion euros in uh, interest, and now in 21, I only have to pay 8 billion. How is that bad? Because you're thinking in terms of looking back. Let's Look ahead. And what do we have as a simple logic? If your debt payments came down, that means they're going to go up in the future as interest rates rise. So all of a sudden, you will have a source of deficit, all sorts of programs, and on top of that, increase in interest payments are going to be a source of deficit. Think about Germany. Germany has literally no debt payments. It's 20 billion euros. What's Germany's country's budget? What's Germany's country's GDP? And if you look at the, inch, if you look at the uh, issuances, in 2001, everything up to 10 year had no interest payments. So these interest payments are pretty much residuals. Someone who bought a bond in 2000, a 30-year bond in 2000, and it's still holding it. Someone who bought a 30-year bond in 2010 or a 20-year bond, and it's still holding it. All the bonds issued with one-year, two-year, five-year, 10-year maturities have no interest. So seeing this, looks really good. But remember the previous slide. No one has actually decreased their debt. No one, apart from few countries like Ireland and Germany, has put their debt under control, especially countries like Italy. And what is the future? Rising interest rates, rising deficits. So ask yourself, if Germany comes to you and says, would you lend us money for 10 years at 0%? Your simplest response is, is literally, dude, inflation's 10%. I'm not giving you that. So who's going to give money to Germany on, at a 10-year period at 1%, at 2%, at 3%? And then you just start thinking about everyone 
else. So if Bund, the 10-year German bond, is at 2%, how much are you going to give money to Italy? What's the price? So having these low interest debt payments has created a false sense of security. A significant portion of decrease in deficits, for example, for a country like Croatia, came from here. So it looks really good, but if you look at the future, it basically is and will be the source of problems. So what are the implications of all this data for a bond trader? Well, we know two things. First thing is supply is increasing. I mean, if you look at the Germany a couple of weeks ago, they said, we're going to do this um, program to help with electricity and utilities and price of energy and it's going to be 1.5% of GDP. Great. Who's going to pay for that? So what has every country in Europe over the last six months told you? We are going to increase our deficit, meaning the supply of bonds is going to go up. Now let's do the basic economics. If supply goes up, what happens to the price? Goes down. But a counterpoint to that is, well, sure, supply can go up, but what if demand goes up? Okay, let's do the demand side. There are three participants that buy bonds. Participant number one is those that have to. So banks, for example, will always have a portion of their balance sheet in government bonds. Insurance will always have a portion of their debt in government bonds, pension funds, mutual funds, stuff like that. But that's simply not enough. These guys cannot purchase enough to maintain the market. The second one is the central bank. But Christine said last week, central bank is going to start decrease their balance sheet, meaning they're going to become a supplier of bonds, not a buyer. And then, all the other investors, which, as it says nicely here, are all gone. How do I know they're all gone? Well, easy. Last year, ECB bought more bonds in Europe than they were issued by government. And the price of bonds actually went down. I'm talking about 10 years. So how is it possible that someone buys more than the supply and the price goes down? It means everyone's selling. Again, ask yourself, if someone comes to you and says, lend me money for one year, what interest rates are you going to charge? Are you going to charge them half a percent or negative half a percent? It's all gone. See, this is all not that bad. We're now getting to the bad things. <laughs> Here's where it gets really interesting. European politicians actually know this. It's official. So you have this EU fiscally, fiscal, it's misspelled. It's fiscally unstable. And it says right here, look, 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 look. <laughs> Headmaster. Fiscal Sustainability Report. This is the wrong title. It should say Fiscal Unsustainability Report by Institutional Paper European Commission. See, it's all this red stuff and yellow stuff. So if you look at the number of countries, you know, overall medium term, look how many of these guys are red. So European Commission has actually published a debt sustainability report which says they're fiscally unstable. So if you really wanted to make money, and this is what it's all about, making money, what's the better way? To buy bonds or to short bonds? Just asking. You know. Maybe people don't know. Oh, guess who? 
Is there a person in this room who doesn't know who this is? Everyone knows. Let me tell you the best lie. There is a lie and a rumor floating around that George Soros broke the Bank of England and caused the devaluation of pound of 10% in one day. That's the, we the Americans would say horseshit. No one, no one can break a central bank under one condition. If you know what you're doing, see, for example, look at the ruble. Elvira knows what she's doing. So ruble devalued, and they got all the speculators in, and then revalued and punished them all. So if you have a central governor, or I guess I got to be politically correct, governess, who knows what they're doing, you cannot break a central bank. It's not that hard to defend the currency. It's actually incredibly easy. Point one, you don't use your currency reserves. If you have a governor who says we're using currency reserves to stabilize the currency market, that means they're an idiot and don't know what they're doing. You never, ever stabilize a currency using foreign currency reserve out of the central bank's balance sheet. That's like monetary defense 101. But there's an accounting data that Soros made $2 billion off of the pound trade. That's indisputable. So what did he actually do? Well, what he did was he listened what the central bank is saying. And what the Bank of England was saying did not match what the data was showing. So how do we create a speculative attack on currency and bond markets? How do you cause a country or countries to bankrupt? Well, debt is not enough. You need to have other conditions. So this is all theory. None of this has ever happened. You need to have an initially low interest rates. So interest rates need to be really low, like, I don't know, maybe even negative. You need to have a low inflation, like really low inflation, preferably deflation, which is increasing for a really long period of time. I don't know, maybe like uh, two years. You need to have an increasing deficit. So you need to have countries or country or countries that have a rising deficit. And it's even better if you have a government that say explicitly they will increase their deficits. And just on a side note, this guy is having a great time. Watch him. No, no, watch him. In about half an hour, he will go completely pale. Trust me on this one. Things will go really bad. You need, you need to have as it says here, high refinancing demands, meaning that 10% of your GDP needs to be refinanced. Now, do you know any countries that have that? Maybe the first letter is E, second letter is M, and third letter is U. Just ask. But here's the best part. Here's what you absolutely need. And that has never happened before until the governor of England, and has never happened after. You need to have a central bank governor that lies all the time, and whose words disagree with data. That's why this is in red. I mean, as a, this is like a vestiges of my times as a professor. If it's red, it must be really important. So obviously, this is going to be on the exam. Fish as in shark. What's an apex predator? Apex predator is in a, an animal that doesn't have a natural enemy, a shark. Like I consider myself a shark or a crocodile, but a small one, not a big one, not great white now. I'm like the, the smaller kind, the one you see, where did I go? The Merze Museum, how do you say that? 
the museum with fish here in Vienna. Yeah, you got, there you got sharks that are like this size, I'm like one of those sizes. But what's the deal with an apex predator? Every single apex predator has a fatal flaw. And their fatal flaw are their young. If you look at, for example, the number of eggs crocodile uh, lays, it's a lot. So how come all the crocodiles don't eat all the uh, animals and completely destroy the ecosystem? Well, because they're incredibly vulnerable when they're young. So not many, many crocodiles are born, but not many reach their full adulthood. If you look at lions, out of a pack, only one lion gets to mate and produce offspring. And again, that lions, the cubs, are again vulnerable. So this period of vulnerability is basically what, it's nature's way of keeping apex predator in check. So there aren't too many of them. So as it says here, ECB missed that opportunity. And I know the date. And I will give it to you. This will be the day that history remember where everything went bad. If there is a breakup of Euro, this will be the day when it started. At their December 2021 ECB policy meeting, Christine Lagarde said the famous sentence, which will become more famous than the Mario Draghi's whatever it take. We have done a lot of soul searching and inflation will go down. If at that meeting she said inflation is a problem, the apex predator would have been destroyed when they're young. Instead, at that point in time, inflation has been rising 11 months in a row. And she said, inflation doesn't exist, it's gonna go down, it's transitory. But in December, her VP says inflation has peaked. Remember how I said that the central governor never governor of central bank never lies? And how I said that's one of the preconditions to destabilize a bond market and a currency? I mean, if everyone knows this, nobody would ever do it. So, let's create a plan of attack. And this is not gonna be like Iron Man. Remember in Avengers 1, when Captain America says to Iron Man, we need a plan of attack, and Iron Man says, I do have a plan attack. No, this is through stages. So how do we do this? Well, first of all, our apex predator has now become larger and larger. So let's hit someone, someone who's known to be vulnerable, and let's see what happens. So you're gonna hit Italy. But how are you going to hit Italy? See, here's a problem with bonds, which we'll see in the United States. There aren't that many of them. I know we, if you look at that debt, for example, Germany's debt or uh, U.S. debt, you know, 20 billion, 30 billion. But if you actually break down that debt, first of all, there are people who hold it, like the central bank. Second, there are people who don't trade it, so it just gets taken out of the system. And then it's not like a stock, like Microsoft has one stock, Goldman Sachs has one stock, Apple has one stock. You have maturities. So if you break this down over a long period of time, on each maturity, you actually don't have that much debt. So you can't simply borrow it and short it. The way you have to do it, you have to use derivatives. Now here's the thing where all the smart people have failed you. All the smart people have told you that you can use algorithms to trade. But in Europe, no one does cash versus futures trading. While in the United States, 
Everyone does that. So what you need to do is you don't actually need to trade cash bonds. You just need to short the futures. And as the futures go down, algorithms programmed on no arbitrage theorem are going to decrease the cash price as well. This is going to be a crucial point later on. So you hit someone and see how the market's going to react. And then you have your stage set. But now you need to wait for more data. So you take the first wave, which was January to March of 2020, and you just hit everyone and see who reacts. See how much the bonds drop. And preferably you want more data, which is higher inflation, higher deficits, more central bank lying. Then you do a second wave which happened June, March to June 2020. And you pause. Now, why do you pause? Because you need to test the other side. The other side, meaning European Central Bank. But during that pause, Christine Lagarde has made a fatal flaw, a fatal error. She told us everything she's going to do. And not just that, she did it in a wrong way. Christine Lagarde said that she's going to set up a mechanism to control monetary policy transmission. That's not true. Monetary policy transmission, by its very definition, is that a central bank changes the quantity of money and then that money moves into the economy. ECB never designed that, never knew how to do that. What she calls monetary, whatever, transition, big words, is actually a spread control between Germany and Italy. But what is a spread? Spread is a difference. So four minus two equals two. Six minus four equals two. So her plan is not to control the yield curve, not to control the interest rates. It's actually to let the interest rates rise, regardless of the price. So as long as Italy and Germany are all rising the same, the spread remains the same, which was like dream come true to all, for all the traders. Because now you know that you can just short everything and here is when things get really bad. She never published, ECB never published that plan. But they started doing it. And then we knew it's over. She overplayed her hand because someone in Financial Times pulled out actual data. And in a period, uh, June to September, ECB sold 17 billion bonds and bought 17 billion bonds. Out of that, 10 were German sold, 10 billion Italian were bought. You see how things are getting bad? Don't worry, we didn't get to the good part. She had no reason to do that. She had no legal right to do that. And you know what she told me? that European Central Bank has stopped being a central bank and it has started to be a fiscal stabilizing mechanism, meaning now I can push them into corner. And all I have to do is short, 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 short until the politicians break and they hit European Central Bank. And then the market's just gonna open and drop like a ton of bricks. And this, wait for December to move in for the kill. She's going to raise rates two times before December. Prices are going to continue to rise. And all we have to do is just short, 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 and the price of bonds are going to collapse. And if you are a bond trader, you will see the daily pattern so you'll see that bonds, Americans will short the bonds early in the morning before Europeans get to work. 
then European both ministries of finance and central bank will buy bonds to stabilize the market and then we'll short them again. And we both know that ECB is gonna stop buying bonds and the, central, and the ministries of finance have a fixed ammunition because they have an increase in deficit. So they cannot defend the price of their bonds for a very long time. Remember how I said at the beginning, there aren't any futures, there's just future. There's nothing no one can do. Well, there is one thing. You can actually decrease your deficits. But wait, what did I, wait, wait, wait. What did I say 15 minutes ago about Germany increasing their deficits? And then on top of that, you have all these candy stuff, like free candy, Italian elections. That's like a best thing ever. What do you think the new prime minister is going to do the moment she's elected? You don't? Don't worry, I'll tell you. <laughs> she's going to flip her position. Remember how she said that Italy will obey fiscal rules? The moment she becomes president, prime minister, she's going to flip her position and say, we're not obeying fiscal rules. We need money to help our economy. Come on, everyone knows Italians are going to do that. I don't care if it's a Tyrol club. I'm like a force of nature. It's not my fault. You know, you don't put your head into a shark's mouth, and when it gets bitten off, expect that it's shark's fault. Don't do stupid stuff like this and you won't get punished. Unfortunately, Europeans just want it that bad. So now, nature will take its course. But, what if I have misconstrued all this? What if everything I have laid out is a misinterpretation of the data? I'm good, but maybe I'm not that good. <laughs> what if all the data that I've showed you kind of makes sense, but it doesn't necessarily have to? What if everything I have showed you is just a wrong picture? How would we double check if this plan of attack plus everything I have explicitly stated is wrong or correct? Well, we would actually look at what is happening in the market. What's this? Oh yeah, I've just wanted to, uh, I forgot about this slide. Before we check the market, I really wanna go to the greatest hits of Christine Lagarde. Remember that one, inflation is transitory? Or that one, that inflation in EU is completely different than inflation in US? Or my all-time favorite, once we stop buying bonds, we will not increase interest rates for a considerable period of time. Remember that one? That was like my all-time favorite. <laughs> I love it. It's like a cult classic. Like Sisters of Mercy. Oh, there you go. Like, good. I mean, you've seen this. And here's another fatal flaw in Europeans. As much as Italians think they're cunning and other European countries have zero cunningness like Germans, you actually believe in the system. Everyone believed her. Remember how she said that once ECB stops buying bonds, they're not gonna increase rates for a considerable period of time. Remember that once ECB starts to increase rates, they're not gonna start selling bonds for a considerable period of time. So all you people, bankers, believed that you will have time to adjust. And then, Christina did what Christina always does. She, play, she, be, she treats monetary policy as politics. So it's like this. First she was in a coalition with inflation, you know. Inflation's transitory, we don't need to increase interest rates, we're not like the US, 
She actually said in, in March, we're not going to increase interest rates because it would have no effect. There's no reason when Fed started to. Then in June, she breaks the coalition with inflation and says, enough, plays hardball. And then in one month, she stops buying bonds, starts increasing interest rates, and in four months or five months, she starts selling bonds out of her portfolio. So what does that do? Well, the interest rates skyrocket. And we will see why that is incredibly important for guys like me. Not to make money, but for the second stages of stuff that's going to happen. Let's do the double check. Remember how I said, let's test someone? This makes no sense. This is Italy, 10-year bond. You see how you have a rise here and then a drop here? There's no reason for a bond market to move like this. Unless... Two years. This is 2022. So this was the October 30th. So the hedge funds said, let's, let's hit them. Let's see how they react. How did I know that the U US hedge funds are involved? And how did I know they're using derivatives? You see this drop? This was a rollover in futures contract. So everyone had to get out of their short position. So price of bonds went up and the yield went down. And what happened after that? We continued. And then you see this thing here? <laughs> you see this thing here? This is June, July, August. There's no data. There's no ECB meetings. You take profits, you accumulate more ammunition and you move in for the kill. There's no more defense. But <clears throat> this is Italy. Could it be that we have exactly the same pattern in France? Oh, look. <laughs> Imagine that. On exactly the same date, their yield goes down when there's a rollover in futures contract. Now, by this time, I wasn't even thinking how right I am. I will explain to you how right I was. I had 1 to 35 leverage in my portfolio. Yeah. Why worry? Why worry? Because I know what's going to happen. I know what is happening. So you can take that kind of an insane position. That was an insane position. It was absolutely insane position to take a 1 to 35 leverage in bonds. But why worry? Christina's going to play out all for you. She has never disappointed me once. But we still have one fortress of fortitude to double check, am I correct? And now, ladies and gentlemen, Oh, look, Germany, exactly the same thing. How could that be? Remember how I talked about an apex predator? You Europeans have never met people like that. You have never met American bond traders. You do not have mental capacity to understand what kind of bloodlust they have. And we are talking about that. We're talking about bloodlust. And you do not understand there's no values, no morality, nothing. It's just money. So why wouldn't I participate in a financial collapse of Europe if I can make money off of it? Yeah, sure, five, 10 million people are gonna lose their jobs. But you know whose problem that is? Christine Lagarde, Ursula von der Leyen, or whoever you guys have for prime minister, that's their problem. They should solve it, not me. People like me, again, are nothing but a force of nature. 
I've never heard anyone complaining about sharks eating fish or whales eating fish or tigers eating other animals. It's nature way of things. What Christine Lagarde with the rest of those clowns has done, she has opened room for the worst, most destructive part of financial markets to come in and feast. There are no other words for that. And now, there will be a price to pay. So here is the future. Yield curve is gonna shift. It'll shift significantly and it'll tilt more. It'll be more than a parallel shift because as deficits rise, as interest payments rise, people will be less and less willing to borrow to European governments. This will cause the interest rates to rise. Inflation will not stop. Here's why. There are years that change the system. And we can run through the history of United States. So you have 7, 29, 46, 73, 2000, and 2021. The financial collapse of, 2000, of 1907 caused Fed to be created and that changed the system. The financial collapse of 29 caused depression and caused a deflationary state of the economy which lasted for 17 years. That deflationary state of economy stopped in 1946 when all the GIs came from Europe, started spending, and inflation increased. Then, in 73, the Phillips curve broke down and the United States entered into a stagflationary equilibrium. That stagflationary equilibrium was broken by Walker's disinflation program in 82. So you have years where the system changes. 21 was a year like that. So all the other periods of low interest rates, low inflation, deflation, that state of the economy doesn't exist anymore because now we have inflation. And this will not gonna be a 15 minute inflation. We're back to the economy of, state of the economy where inflation was normal to be three, four percent. Now the only question is, in which year we are in the United States and Europe? And here, I will argue that Europe is in 1973. We're at the beginning of a long-term deflation, stagflationary period, while the United States is in 1946, where inflation will increase, but the economy is going to be just fine. And I'm going to run you through Europe, then I'm going to run you through US. So inflation will continue to rise. ECB will try to defend the bond prices, obviously fail, because someone's going to sue them and put an end to their policy of being a fiscal stabilizing mechanism. The rise of interest rates will significantly threaten the profitability of banks due to repricing risk. Now think. What was an interest rate on household deposits in banks in 1990s in Austria? Was it 2 or 3%? Sure, whatever. How many loans, fixed rate loans, do banks, Austrian banks, have on their balance sheet? And are those fixed rate loans at 7% or are they at 1%? So what happens with those loans when deposit rate goes up to 2%, all of a sudden you have a losing asset. And, okay, now someone's gonna say, but no, 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 wait, wait, wait. You can hedge that. Excellent. And how exactly are you gonna hedge that? There are three ways. Use futures. They don't exist for 10 years out. And if you use them, you have a huge basis risk or swaps or whatever. Well, we can sell them, great. At what discount? Who's going to buy you a 1% loan? They're not buying Germany's bonds. Or third, we can issue new loans at a higher interest rate to cover for losses on this. 
Well, no, that's under the assumption you have a healthy economy and you can give out investment loans that's gonna produce new jobs and economic growth. But if you're in a stagflationary equilibrium, that's not gonna play out. Then the credit placement of banks will deteriorate, which will lead to a decrease in lending with an increase in credit risk. Fiscal expansion, which is now based on growth of social assistance. So nobody ever tells you that there's a time lag in inflation. So when inflation goes up, the value added tax immediately gives you more money to your uh, fiscal capacity, more money to federal, whatever state budget. But then the costs start to rise six or 12 months later. And then when inflation starts to interfere with real economy, like you have a decrease in real spending in Germany for the last two months, then your actually fiscal revenues go down but you have an increase in spending. If not for social programs, then for interest rates you have to pay. A growth in deficits will create a spiral of interest rates growth, which will lead to eventually to a reduction in budget spending, which will probably decrease inflation, but it's gonna cause a severe recession. Maybe if the source of inflation is supply side, we're gonna have a full blown stagflationary equilibrium where budgets will have to go down and inflation is going to remain. EU economies will enter a long-term structural inflation, which is basically stagflationary equilibrium. That's what I'm betting on. For several years, you will not be able to generate jobs and growth. The green transition will be pushed heavily at a detrimental risk. You already see the craziness because Germany is closing nuclear power plants while opening coal power plants. Seriously, like, what are you smoking? <laughs> EU regulation will increase because that's the only play bureaucrats have. You will have more and more regulation and you will have more and more calls for fiscal stability. And more and more regulation will simply stifle the economy. The political intolerance will rise. Remember how a couple of months ago, someone said, you know, Austria, sh not Austria, sorry, Hungary should just leave European Union? That's not talk among friends. That's not talk about people, countries that want to help each other. And also, remember that first slide where I looked at the amount of debt? Did you ever wonder why hunting dogs are small? Like, there's no such thing as a dog. Well, maybe, maybe that Kavka's shepherd. But hunting dogs are really small. And boar is really big. So why is it that hunting dogs are small? Because there's a lot more of them than prey. So you have all these countries with no debt, very small amounts, that will turn on the big countries. And you're seeing this policy. Look at last quarter. Year on year, Germany had a growth of 0.6%. But Italy had five and a half. Croatia had seven. Spain is having the best economy in decades. So why should they give up their gas? Why should they give up their electricity to help German economy? It's gonna be payback for Greece. At one point in time, Greece is gonna say, well, we have this program of austerity worked great for us 10 years ago. Maybe you Germans should try it. Oh. That's what I say. But then I'm gonna make a lot of money trading bonds. There will be a significant drop in standard. You already have that your real wages are negative. They're gonna continue to be negative. And inflation by the end of the year will probably move above 12%, maybe even 15. That'll be real interesting. And it will not decrease below 4% for, for years. So that's the future. How do you like me now? <laughs> but that's true, it's not my fault. But you know how they have those TV sales? And they say, but that's not all. So that's not all, folks. Let's do the United States. 
As you all know, United States is in a recession. They had two quarters of negative growth. Inflation's rampant. Yield curve has inverted. And the economy is going to collapse. Actually, that's all wrong. That's completely wrong. Everything, every single point here is absolutely incorrect. Every single one. So let's do every single one. Yes, the 2 to 10 year yield curve has inverted. And yes, every single year, every single time the 2 to 10 year yield curve has inverted, there was a recession. So why it is not going to happen this time? Well, because every single time previously, it was because of restrictive monetary policy. Yield curve inversion this time actually happened because of restrictive fiscal policy. There aren't enough bonds in the system. And because there aren't enough bonds in the system, the interest rates are not as high as they should be, and yield curve has inverted. So this time, it actually is different. Let's do that. So now someone is going to say, but Nevin, look at the numbers. U.S. debt has significantly increased. Well, the U.S. debt is kind of like an onion. You need to peel off. Actually, no, that's wrong. U.S. debt is kind of like an artichoke. That's a better. Is it a fruit or a vegetable? I never liked it. So if you peel the artichoke, you get to the sweet center. That's the U.S. debt. So yes, the U.S. debt is around 30 and a half billion. However, that is the total debt. If you look at something called debt available to the public, it's significantly lower. It's only 24. So what happened to six and a half trillion dollars? Well, that's actually government owing money to itself in pension funds. So just like United, uh, Europe, where people pay, Europe has a pension system which is pay as you go, where you have money and you give it to the government, the government gives it to the pensioners. Well, United States has a fully funded pension system. They take money, put it in a fund, and then pay it to the retirees. So that's why the debt available to public is considerably smaller. So that's a layer one. Let's do a layer two. Well, Fed owns five and a half of those trillion dollars. So out of that 30, six is owned by government. Another five and a half is owned by Fed. So now you're getting to around 19. And you could take out other stuff like foreign central banks, and you will have, see that the free float of uh, total debt is considerably smaller. Also, if you look at the increase in debt, it actually hasn't been that much. Like, since the start of corona, debt increased by seven trillion, but the GDP increased by almost 20%. So if you look at these two numbers, the rise in debt versus the rise in GDP, they're not that far apart. But we'll get to a lot more interesting slide, which is this. For almost a year, the United States has not issued any bonds. Almost none. This and I actually didn't bother to make this nice. I just copy-pasted it off of the Treasury's report. For those of you that don't know, fiscal year in US is October to October. So fiscal year 21 is October 20 to October 21st. So this was total how much it received, 4 billion, how much it spent, 6.8, and what was the deficit, 2.7. But I have this data up to the July. So July of fiscal year 21, you have increase in, you have revenues of 3.3, spending of 5.8, and deficit of 2.5. If you look at this fiscal year, you have 4.1 in revenues, meaning that revenues 
went up by 700 billion. Why? Because of employment skyrocketed. Spending decreased by, four, by $1 trillion. So US fiscal spending decreased by 4% of GDP. You have to have a decrease in GDP when you have that kind of fiscal contraction. And the total deficit went up, went down by 1.7 billion. So if you look at how much deficit you have this year, this calendar year, it's only 340 billion. And this calendar year, Fed bought around uh, 370 billion. So this is kind of like null and void. And if you look at the fiscal year, so in October till July, you only have 720 billion deficit. Half of that was purchased by Fed. So yes, here the deficit was huge. But here, in this fiscal year and this calendar year, there's almost no bonds production. Bonds aren't being produced. There aren't enough of them in the system. And this year, you have a huge nominal growth of GDP. Last year, you had a huge real growth of GDP. So if you're looking at last couple of years, you're basically seeing a constant decrease in the production of bonds. And when you take Fed, you basically see that there are no bonds in the system. And in October, not in October, in August, you're going to have a probably around 300 billion deficit. But in September, you're going to have three to 400 billion surplus. Because there's a Norway's, because of the way they collect taxes, United States has a fiscal surplus in January, April, uh, and September, four times a year. So this total deficit that we have right now, 700 billion, which is 3% of GDP, this is probably gonna be lower by the end of the fiscal year. And then next year again, unless they introduce another trillion dollar plan, the budget is just getting filled. There are no bonds, there's no supply of bonds. And this is incredibly important because then who is going to be the supplier of bonds? Fed, when they're decreasing their balance sheet. And that's why they, I will show you they can do whatever they want with the yield curve, whatever they want. Because the fiscal side is not supplying enough, it's the Fed that becomes the supplier of bonds. So see here why the US bonds haven't dropped 20%? They simply can't. So if you look at the interest rates in Germany or Italy, Italy went from a half percent 10 year in December to 4% now. Germany went from negative half a percent to 2% now. What happened to a US 10 year? Oh, looky, that thing went up one and a half percent. Well, the Fed raised interest rates by 2%, and it's going to raise another percent or more. So why aren't these yield curves pushing forward? Again, there isn't enough bonds in the system. So bonds are being bought. Now here, I'll tell you what the Fed will do. The ultimate evil thing. They're probably going to do a reverse operation twist. Operation Twist was when Ben Bernanke started buying long-term bonds in order to decrease the far end of the yield curve. Well, now they're going to start selling the far end of the yield curve and buying the short end of the yield curve. And that will steepen the yield curve in U.S., the recessionary indicator, 2 to 10 year, will magically disappear. And all of a sudden, looky, looky, US is no longer in recession. Like this thing, Powell, Powell did this really good, really good. Like they say in that movie Spinal Tap, on scale of one to 10, when I really wanna crank it up, I do 11. 
Fed is running monetary policy on 11. I've never seen stuff like that. I've never read stuff like, about stuff like that. It is as good as it gets. You, know, you want to know the answer why they're so good and how I know what they're going to do? Well, the answer is incredibly egoistic. The professor of monetary policy will tell you that's what I would have done. You have a fiscal consolidation and you start controlling the production of bonds. So how come none of these hedge funds are attacking the US with a huge deficit? And you have every now and then people on articles and forums saying that the US is gonna bank go bankrupt because of the size of their debt. Well, that's as good of a joke as it gets. Almost as good of what Christina said about soul searching. So, the two things Fed doesn't care about, inflation and interest rates. I know that you're being conditioned by professors of monetary policy, none of them dressed in three-piece suits, that Fed wants to increase interest rates and inflation is really important. Inflation in the US is done. It's over. The commodities dropped, producer price index dropped, is dropping, and the CPI will just continue to drop. So Fed knows inflation is going to stabilize. There's no need for them to increase interest rates and cause recession. What they have to do is really talk aggressive and raise interest rates a little just to maintain credibility. So what Fed is now doing basically with interest rates is as I said, maintaining credibility and accumulating ammunition for next recession. Like they would probably like it to have it at four and a half percent because then they can do whatever they want during next recession. What Fed really done masterfully, probably the best I've ever seen, they, have, they managed to hide quantitative tightening. Remember how no one talks about that and it's not in a spotlight? This was Powell's true great trick. What was the greatest thing devil ever did? Convince people he doesn't exist. So what did Powell do? He basically convinced QT is irrelevant. When's the last time you heard of him talking about QT and about how he's decreasing bonds? It simply glided over. Increase in labor participation rate and increase in lending. That's what Fed cares about. Those are the two variables they look at. That's why they're constantly pushing stock market down. Because the only way to have an increase in labor participation rate is for all the YOLO idiots. YOLO means you only live once straight, there you go, to go back to, to work. So the only way for YOLO idiots to stop trading is to have the stock market depressed. That's why he's so aggressive. Like the Jackson Hole speech, like we were watching that and just laughing all the time. He doesn't care about inflation, and I'll tell you why. The Americans are not like you. They will flip. The moment inflation hits a number three, like 3.8, 3.5, he will say something like this. Um, you know, inflation, yeah, it's really high, yeah, but if you look at the data, we had that long period of under 2%, and then we had a short period of high inflation, so in the average, it's around 2%, and there's no need for us to cause recession in order to push the inflation under 2%. He's gonna flip. He's gonna say that 3.5% inflation is okay. And the moment he does that, everyone will wake up, realize that the stock market's cheap, the economy's doing great, and off the races we go. Now, he's not going to do that tomorrow. He's not going to do that this or next quarter. Maybe next quarter. But he needs to see three or four numbers of inflation under with the first number three. And then he's going to flip Fed's position. Why? Americans are pragmatic. They're not idiots. Why would Americans push their economy in a recession in order to achieve inflation of 1.5%? What's the purpose? So that's his ultimate play. That's what no one counts on. It's not that he's going to cause recession by raising interest rates. 
And it's not that he's going to cause recession and then have to decrease interest rates. No, Fed's not going to decrease interest rates. I mean, they might do stuff where they oscillate the interest rate, but he's going to flip the inflation targeting. And then that's going to stabilize. So what they want is for labor participation rate to go up so that you have more people working, which means more money, but it also means less inflationary pressure from wages, and for bank lending to go up. Because when bank lending goes up, you have more investment loans, more investment loans means more jobs. Now, here's the thing that for some strange reason, Europeans don't get and don't understand. The supply curve of loans doesn't look like this. That's just insane. The supply curve of banking loans looks like this. It's like a sickle. You know, the Communist Manifesto, hammer and a sickle, okay? Why does it look like this? If you have an incredibly low interest rate, 0.9%, banks don't want to lend. They don't want to lend because the cost of credit eats up their net interest margin. It's too risky. So as interest rates go up from zero, the lending actually increases. Look at the data in the US. The bank lending increased when Fed started to increase interest rates. But then, if you look at the supply curve, no bank under normal condition, let's say inflation is 3%, no bank will give you a loan at 25% because you know, bank knows you cannot pay it back. That's why the demand curve is classic, but the supply curve curves backward. That's the reason. That's why they know that by increasing interest rates, they're not destimulating investments. They're actually stimulating investments. Because as they move interest rates from zero, banks are going to start lending. And they're going to lend more, more investments, more jobs, kaboom. That's the play. That's what they know. That's why increasing interest rates from zero is really good. That's what Christine and rest of European crowds never got. That's why European banks are going to suffer. That's why repricing risk are going to kill them. And then on top of that, Christine let people much worse than me to ravage and rampage Europe. So here's what Fed ultimately wants. Fed wants to fade into obscurity. If you look at last five years, it's all about central banks. Everyone talks about central banks all the time. It's insane. Central banks are not that relevant to an economy. So what we need is some peace and quiet. So Fed wants to raise interest rates, keep them flat, and let the economy grow and fade into obscurity. I don't know if you remember, for example, period 2003 to 2005, interest rates were at 0.25% and nobody worried about Fed. Or if you remember 94, 98, Greenspan increased by 25, decreased by 25, increased by 25, decreased by 25. Nobody paid attention to Fed. It was another institution. So this is what Fed wants. They want to raise interest rate and fade into obscurity. How do I know that? They're not talking about QT. If they really wanted, if they didn't know inflation is going to go down, if they really needed to desperately fight inflation, if they really were afraid of recession, they would be talking a lot more about QT. Instead, they're trying to normalize their balance sheet. That's how they tip their hand, which is uncharacteristic for Americans. But then again, bond traders in combination with monetary policy are especially dangerous and toxic cocktail. So, but don't worry, here's what's gonna happen. I will now, at the end, tell you my final prophecy. <clears throat> Some of you have Googled me during this lecture 
and you're gonna Google me when you go back home, and you're gonna see my website, which is incredibly poetic because the title of the website is LOTI, which stands for the last of the independents. And you might read my resume and you will see it's not impressive. I mean, but the, I do have PhD and stuff like that, but it's not from an important school. And I never worked for a big important company. I mean, I did kind of, but at a relevant post. And I wrote some books which are in creation, which obviously no one read. And you will simply say, there's no way what this guy is saying is right. And there's no way things will play out this way. And that's what you should do. You should go home. You probably don't have a guilty conscience, so you can drink coffee before you go to bed. Or you can have a, a cup of cocoa, and you will think about this presentation, and you will conclude nothing of this is true. It is too exotic. It's too bizarre. It's too weird. And that's what you should think. And just. You will go to bed, and tomorrow morning, you will not pay any attention to what I've just lectured you, which is the way it should be. You're what we call civilians. You're nice people. You have nice jobs. You have families. You don't want to know about all the evil and bad things that happen in bond markets. And you don't want to know the truth, that bond people have the ability to destroy financial systems if your politicians and central banks just do stupid things, and obviously someone who's running a European Union like Charles Michel and Christine Lagarde and Ursula and Christina, they can't be that bad. So this guy who's from Croatia, who's nobody, not that relevant, cannot possibly know all of this stuff. So there's actually nothing to worry about. Everything will be just fine. Have a cup of coffee cocoa or coffee, go to sleep, and in the morning, it will be another good day for you. You'll go to your job, and you'll have lots of fun, and I will fade out of your memory within a week. So I know this was bad. See, this guy's not laughing anymore. Stir with cocaine. <laughs> so there's nothing to worry about. And on top of that, if you do have a guilty conscience or are worried about stuff, there's like 20 bottles of wine in the other room. So drink as much as you need, as long as you need it, not to worry about any of this stuff.